Our next panel is on putting data in decision making. So we have a number of panelists here in person and one I think joining us virtually. I'm Rob Johnson. I'll be joining the chat to field your questions. So do keep those coming in. I will pass them over to Chris Keneally who will be the panel moderator. And I think everyone looks ready to go. So I will leave you in Chris's capable hands. Well, thank you, Rob Johnson. Thank you, Rob Johnson. The, this is part of your regularly scheduled programming. So we will need the mic. Is the audio on? Can you hear me now? Wonderful. Well, it's my pleasure to lead this discussion on data-driven decision-making. When CCC proposed the topic last summer, Mark Carden provided important direction that my priority should be to emphasize the transformative possibilities of DDDM, data-driven decision-making, when we place quality data at the center of our organizations and our work, what are we trying to achieve? That's the question we'll ask. British economist and Nobel laureate Ronald Coase once said that if you torture your data long enough, it'll tell you anything. My panel, thankfully, will advise us to treat our data well, because then it will return the favor. They each have to share ambitious goals and some early stage success stories for how a focus on metadata management opens a 360 degree view of the research ecosystem. And they will explain why data-driven decision making has helped them to address concerns of sustainability, compliance, and access. We're going to start with Katia Laranjera, who joins us from Lisbon, Portugal. Bom dia, Katia. Hello. It's actually boa tarde now. It's afternoon. <laughs> 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 well, uh, Hello, nice it, it to is, be here. Thank you very much. For it the is invitation. very good to have you with us. Uh, Katia Langera is with PT Chris, and you have worked uh, in London before, so you're perhaps uh, here in great spirit. You were a neuroscientist uh, with the Crick Institute, and may have some colleagues even in the room. Um, the, the motto for PT Chris is connected research, and that's because what you're all about is integrating this open ecosystem and, and promoting removal of bureaucracy and, and the simplification of the processes. So I wonder if you can tell us about the communities and the organizations that you serve there in Portugal and what problem you're trying to address. Sure. So um, I am the manager of PT Greece, as you mentioned. PT Greece is a, a, a program that was launched in 2014 and its ultimate uh, goal is to uh, make the mantra register once, reuse multiple times uh, a reality in Portugal. So we know that in Portugal, but in other parts of the world, uh, it is still very much up to the researcher to update uh, the, their information uh, in a different number of uh, uh, events to in the different entities with which they have to deal with. This can be the universities, investigation uh, research centers, it can be um, the, the funding agencies, and so on and so forth. So there are a number of entities that ask for this uh, information, and it has to be the researcher to over and over again update this information. And of course, if they don't do it, then the data that we have is not as good. Uh, and so what we advocate at PT Greece is that what we should do, what we should move towards is to have an integrated ecosystem in which the information will just flow between all these uh, systems with we do, we two important benefits. One is to alleviate the bureaucratic burden that still lies on the researcher's shoulders. And the other is, of course, that by doing that, we are also making or promoting that in the end we'll have data that is more reliable, more updated, and also complete. So good data will, will make us have better decision making and also uh, the whole process of uh, data-driven decisions will be more effective and more efficient and that's what we all aim for. 
And, and in this open ecosystem, what, what are you relying on? I, I believe you know, the so-called PIDs, the persistent identifiers, are really critical here. Can you elaborate on some of them that have been most useful for you? Sure. So uh, what one of the main uh, line of actions of PT Greece is actually to develop this regulatory uh, framework and infrastructures that will support that regulatory framework. And that's actually the first step. Uh, and when I say regulatory framework, I'm very much talking about PIDs for sure, but also other standards. So what we want is to have this common language so that we can bring different data sources, merge it all together, and that can only be done through interoperability, right? So through this common language. And of course, PIDs are an important part of this common language. We have uh, been focusing a lot on having these uh, uh, infrastructures to enforce the use of, of PIDs. Uh, and on that subject, we have uh, worked a lot on having uh, defined and established services to promote the use of um, organizational identifiers uh, and also uh, research identifiers and scientific outputs identifiers. So wherever we uh, see that there's a gap in terms of infrastructure, we try to uh, overcome that gap and develop the infrastructure and we've done so by um, Develop, developing a, a database that aggregates funding information. We are now in the process of registering DOIs for grants. Uh, and we have also these services to identify organizations and researchers. So we have here this triad of researchers, funding and, uh, um, and uh, uh, organizations. Uh, and for scientific outputs, of course, we also promote the use of uh, uh, DOIs and other uh, persistent identifiers. So we try to focus very much on all these core entities of the um, of the research ecosystem and promote as much as possible the use of PIDs and other uh, standards. Right. And and so tell us though how, the, how all of that allows you to really op uh, monitor the success of of the open ecosystem that you're trying to achieve. What are, the, what are the ways you use those tools? Right. So uh, I was telling you about this part of uh, PT Greece, which is to develop this regulatory framework. And then we have the other bit, which is as important as the first one, which is to promote the use of this regulatory framework. Because ultimately, what we wish for is to have this integrated ecosystem, to have interoperability. And now that we have, so since 2014 up to now, we have been working on this. And only now we are actually starting to see some of the, um, I was telling you before, this is very much a submarine work up to the point where we start to leverage all this work and develop added value services, such as the ones that we are developing at the moment. And this is, for example, indicators system that allows institutions to draw uh, information and metrics from uh, from the data that is registered by the researchers themselves. So to give you a specific example, we have developed a, a national uh, scientific curriculum management platform, which serves the researchers. And uh, the idea here is that this platform can be used by the researcher as a tool every time they have to submit their curricular information. And this, um, this uh, mantra of using this tool for this purpose means that researchers only have to fill in this system once. So they have to keep updating it, of course, but once they have it updated, they can use it in different instances. So they can use it to apply for funding, and that's already a reality. They can use it uh, in their relationship with their uh, uh, research institution when the research institution need to prepare progress reports or performance reports, for example. So this is just an example to say that a single system, if it is used by many players, then the benefits of uh, on the burden of having to register the information became becomes um, alleviated in the sense that you don't have to do it again and again. It's just once and then it can be used by uh, the multiple stakeholders. 
Um, and that's, that's the case, for example, for the indicators. So this system that we have developed means that institutions do not have to ask for this information again to the researcher. They can just use the information that has been registered for different purposes for the researcher himself and draw conclusions from that data. That's one of the examples. The other example is the fact that by having this curriculum management platform integrated with many different systems of the research ecosystem, both national and international, allows, uh, according to our estimates, to as allowed already to save around 5 million uh, minutes in registering information. So all these integrations that we have developed mean that we have saved this much minutes in time of researches at time that can be used to to perform uh, science and teaching all the other activities that are the core business of this uh, uh, of researchers. Right. Well, 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 Katya. So it sounds like th so the good quality data metadata management is allowing you to take friction out of the process, and that's clearly what researchers want and everyone else downstream as well. So, so Katya Laranjera in Lisbon, Portugal. Thank you very much. And I want to turn now to. Uh, my panelist here in London, um, and Dr. Uh, Jose Sam, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, you're a professor at Santa, Santa Catarina State University uh, in Brazil, but you have an extensive knowledge of, or background rather, in knowledge engineering. You've, you've worked uh, for a variety of governments and science organizations, the Pan American Health Organization, NIH, NSF and, and, and so forth, but you want to tell us about uh, a database, a, 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 a data management platform that's been around for quite some time, that, that Brazil developed in the late 1970s, the, the Lattice platform. Uh, it's named for Cesar Lattice, who was a, 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 a he discovered the, the, the pion, which is a subatomic particle, and he even has a song written by uh, Gilberto Gil about his work. So he's quite, uh, quite the scientist to make a, a sort of, uh, you know, to put a foot into the world of, of the arts as well. But this platform, this, this Lashes platform, is something that really uh, has, has changed the way you do science in Brazil. T tell us about that. Well, um, it, was, it was developed in the uh, end of the 90s. And uh, th at that time, we had very different and uh, very, uh, a list of different CV systems regarding researchers uh, and, and the data about their past activities, uh, research and projects. And this was uh, uh, for this specific federal agency to do uh, evaluation on proposals of grants and, and, and the evaluation pr process. Um, it was very hard. and. Uh, what we, uh, what we did was we unified this, we studied some metadata that would be uh, necessary to integrate some of these different data sources. And we consulted from uh, a list of 600 uh, researchers in different fields on what would be interesting for them regarding the CV structure. Right? So we built that into the system and we're talking uh, 1998. And if uh, here the internet was uh, kind of not a main thing yet, uh, imagine in Brazil, right? So what we did was we did uh, develop these simple services that brought researchers into this uh, space and in, 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 in using the platform. Like we would give them uh, different graphs regarding his or, or her uh, CV information. Who have you published more? Who, what areas do you work more? And then we just built their web page. That was a big thing at that time, right? right. So, so today, LATS has uh, almost 8 million users in Brazil and, and from different countries. And um, we developed other systems that were connected to it. But it really changed the uh, evaluation, um, the, the funding that was uh, um, granted in Brazil because it took out of some main um, cities and started to spread funding money into different regions that at, at that time weren't getting that uh, approved, right? So what we sought was... I, I don't want you to go by that too fast because that's really important, isn't it? We've been hearing a lot throughout the conference about the importance of, of uh, 
finding you know, ways to establish greater equity and to be more equitable in, in, in research and science and, and the entire uh, workflow. Here, what you're saying is, because of the data you were able to collect, because of the vision you had into the system, you were able to drive funding, to drive research into places where they, they might have been deprived or on the margins in the past. Yes, exactly. And, and we did that because once there was a platform in place and the evaluation cycle had to consider publicly available data on uh, the researcher or, uh, or, um, or his profile or her profile, uh, people that were part of the panel, evaluation panel, would have to justify why they didn't have any conflict of interest. Right? So decision making here with uh, data and with this platform uh, was, was bringing uh, some a form of equity and, and, and some form of transparency. Right? Right. Um, and, and, and then we'll, there were uh, these data, uh, data warehouse structures built on top of research groups and, and, and other uh, data sources. And this helped uh, you know, build not just the evaluation phase, but also monitoring. So, so yes. Right. Is. And as you say, though, in 1997, it was very early days for all yep. of this. And, and there really were no, there were none of the now uh, internationally uh, accepted standards in existence. So how are you leveraging the standards that have come along? That must make a well, great difference in your work. Yes, now we have uh, started to work on, and, and, and we're partnering with uh, Portugal, and uh, uh, Katja is my colleague, and we've learnt, we learned from them how to bring all these uh, persistent identifiers in, in, in a way that you, know, you can um, add uh, uh, outside uh, data sources and combine data. And uh, we've, we've learned from their uh, lessons on, on uh, using this data. And uh, we are finding some challenges regarding uh, data, data quality in some of these data sources. And this, this is something that we have to address. Uh, and you know, data isn't reference. Say you have a publication, there is no DOI, there is no um, uh, co-authors identification. So in LATS today we have, you, you have, once you add a publication to your profile, you have to reference the DOI and, uh, and, and also reference co-authors. And once we extract the data, if the, the co-author is not identified, it won't let you add to your, to your CV, right? So, and, and, and there's other uh, validations. There's not really uh, any, this is not rocket science, but it's, it's, um, it, it should uh, benefit the, the, the quality of data, right? Absolutely. And, and in Brazil, though, your focus is on, you told me, on, on building bridges, that there's, um, you know, various elements of the research ecosystem that you want to uh, sort of enable to, to participate and collaborate. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, so, so we, we are uh, trying to connect uh, with different uh, data sources, mainly the um, theses and dissertations that are published in Brazil and, and outside, and, and connecting. And, and, and now we're starting to work and re-engineer the, the whole Laches model to uh, add uh, Sarif and Vivo as references. So um, we, we, we're working together with a group in, in Germany and uh, discussing uh, the ontology alignment between Serif structure and Vivo structure, seeing where, you know, where the, the issues are, are between these alignments. And, uh, after this is done, also align with the LATS uh, ontology or, or the LATS structure. Mm -hmm. so, and it's, so it's, I think we're hearing that you've, you've come a long way with Lattice. There's, a, there's still a long way to go. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Well, well, Dr. Shosei san thank you very much. And I want to turn now to Veronica Spinka, who is uh, Senior Vice President at the TEMA Group. And, and uh, you've had a career where you've been working in various open access programs uh, of many kinds for over a decade at TEMA. You're concentrating on the medicine and chemistry journal portfolios. And, 
Um, you know, uh, we were just hearing about uh, uh, Jose's interconnecting system, and I, I, it makes me think about all kinds of modes of transportation. Katya's already mentioned submarines, and I think about trains, and I think about maybe the, the trains that are almost riding underneath us as we speak right now. And, um, you know, for, for, for a journey around London or from London to if you go to uh, St. Pancras, to Amsterdam, Paris, or wherever you'd like, uh, you, you really need to pack well. And I think you have an idea for what the researchers should pack before they get on that journey uh, towards publication. Tell us what. Um, thank you, Chris. And I, the more we discuss the data drain idea, the more appealing it becomes to me because it's so visualizing so much you know, what we actually expect from the researcher and the responsibility that we have as a publisher, more or less facilitating the tracks and being the train itself, right? So when we say, but what does the researcher needs to pack to actually um, enter the data train journey, I would rather say as least as possible, right? Because in principle, we no, as the track, as the train, as publishers, should support and facilitate the researchers as much as we can on getting their research published, on getting the article out in the open, similar to what we heard yesterday in Sibylle's panel um, from Ben, the chemist, actually reminding us how important it is for researchers to go back to the basics and just focusing on getting the article out. So what we are doing at team here, um, really trying to reassess and reestablishing us as focusing on said researcher, entering the train, entering the track, no? um, getting the article published, by taking actually a step back um, and what we're doing at team, when I say uh, taking a step back, is essentially um, uh, approaching the data um, question from two angles. One, first of all, and I know team is a little bit late in the game here, um, harvesting the data and the metadata in a very centralized space, but also then most importantly from a different perspective because you know, data is only as good as the process, as the policies behind it, also re-assessing um, and tackling actually the process and the policy question to ensure that the data that we are going to harvest actually fulfills and actually answers um, a certain use case. And this use case, of course, and this is what Katia was saying, I'm um, thinking this from the side of the researcher you know, entering the track, but also in the triangle from Katia um, and analogies to also think about this from an institution's perspective. We were hearing Laura from Chis discussing this also just today, but then of course also from a researcher's perspective to really ensure that we as publishers serving the track, um, being more or less the train, um, actually are you know, fulfilling um, our purpose, again, serving in the triangle, the researcher, the, um, the um, funder, but also in the institution. And, and, and it, it comes down to data quality then, because it really improves the experience. You've put the author there at the center of things, and without the quality data, their experience down the line, the experience of the reader, or at the researcher to reader <laughs> conference, the experience of the reader likewise is going to suffer. Indeed, right? And I think this is very much, and I feel like I'm just repeating from all these kind of great panelists that we had today, also with Tasha from counter perspective, right? Because what the reader expects from us when they enter the final stage, and again, Chris, I'm thanking you a lot for this kind of analogy of the train. I'm using this also at team and not quite a lot. Because indeed, you know, when you enter the final stage, when you get your article out and published, you also want to distribute it as widely as possible. And this is where also then a different set of data comes into play, as Tasha was discussing today you know, with the, with the counter statistics and actually also with the 5.0 release, you know, focusing here more on the open access perspectives. Yeah. Okay, all right. And, and um, I asked you, I've asked everybody in our preparation about the, the state of data quality today. <laughs> and to, to, to give it a ranking, I'm a fan of one to 10, you know, uh, where one is we don't even want to talk about it, <laughs> and 10 is we never shut up, it's so good. Where, where, where is it? <laughs> it's more in the corner of I just do not want to talk about it. But, <laughs> but I'm here, you know, to, to actually do that. And, <laughs> Um, and it's, um, I think the more I also engage in conversations um, at the conference today, right, the more, unfortunately, you know, fortunately, it becomes also very clear that um, with team we're not the only one, right, I'm kind of um, ad addressing that hurdle. Um, and yeah, it's, um, I think we need to kind of really pack no, the, the backpack um, a little bit better and focus on the data quality. And most importantly, actually see that we can take the researcher out of the equation as much as possible. Because in this triangle, and this is my own personal opinion, actually the party that actually cares the least about these metadata points is the researcher, right? Who cares is the funder, it's the institution, and it's the publisher at the end to ensure that we get this article structure, uh, the metadata structured, 
what a researcher is actually caring about is getting the article out and published in a version of record, and that's the data that counts for them, right? And if we are basically taking data points out of context, um, and I think a very good example here is um, one of the many, you know, why I'm also saying that the data quality is um, semi-lacking, um, that we are asking researchers to provide us, for example, a funder's ID at the point of submission. And honestly, I think if, we, if Ben is still in the room um, from yesterday's panel, if you ask a researcher what do you care the most about at the point of submission, I don't think they would ever say, um, actually, I will really look forward to provide a funder of ID, right? <laughs> they care about getting this article submitted. And um, from that perspective, I think there's a lot for us as a community also to do, to rethink in, a, in, in that journey, on that track, right? What we as publishers, but also institutions and funders and also the ecosystem you know, supporting us with the service vendors, what we can do to actually ensure that to remove this burden from the researchers who, again, is actually in this equation, actually caring about the quality of this data point the least, right? And we care, so we, it's on us to actually find a solution to ensure that the data quality is increasing by harvesting actually metadata out of the XML and if, um, ensuring it's aligning with the version of record. And it's about for you on this on this journey about alignment, keeping those tracks straight, but also that enables collaboration. There's uh, interchanges that exist. Yeah, because at the end, no, um, it's not a it's not an island, right? We're an archipelago, <laughs> <laughs> um, and also to think this is why I'm also kind of very grateful to join this panel today because we are representing different perspectives in this ecosystem. And at the end, with a publisher like Tima, we are not building our own submission or peer review system, right? It's um, too, uh, honestly, too, with 200 journals, just too small for that. So we are heavily relying, of course, on the ecosystem, on the service providers also in the room to um, support us. And, um, and very much what I would like to encourage us to do, really rethink, and, um, and I now I'm repeating now, and just really take the researcher out of the equation as much as possible because we care and we need to care right about the, about the metadata quality because it is about database decision making for business reasons, not for access reasons, for compliance reasons. <coughs> but at the end, what does the researcher want? They want to get, get the article published. Yeah? And, and, it's, and so, so that reliance on the whole system means you're relying on standards ultimately. It ultimately, it's about relying on standards indeed, and this is the collaboration point that you were mentioning before, right? Um, and there are um, means already, right, to um, seek alignment um, and also define certain standards, but I think with, with the pits that you were addressing, also with Katia earlier, it's a way on the road, right? But essentially, um, what I'm currently missing is this kind of commonly taking this step back, really rethinking the approach, and I just cannot repeat this often enough, really take the researcher out of the equation. The researcher does not care about providing a funder of ID at the point of submission, right? They do care about the funder of information, the funding information that is put in the acknowledgements, in the manuscript, in the Word document at the end, and in the XML. And we, we as a community, shall actually seek and ways to define standards to rather focus on actually what at the end counts for the researcher and for the reader. All right, well, Veronica Speaker, thank you very much uh, with, with Tima. Thank you very much for that. And, and finally, I want to turn to my CCC colleague, Michael Healy. Michael Healy, welcome. Uh, he's the executive director of our rights order and international relations groups, and he has 25 years' experience in standards, PIDs, and lots of adjacent areas. Currently chairs the ISNI International Agency. And Michael, you're, you're here to share with us some lessons learned in that career uh, and how they may apply for this discussion and for our audience as well. So, so talk about the ways that standards and, and this, this focus on data quality has really changed some other adjacent media industries. Sure. Well, I, I think the first thing to say is it's my first researcher to read a conference. And despite all this involvement in metadata standards over the years. And so I, I do want to say to Mark how grateful I am for being here. It's very, very striking uh, sitting, listening to yesterday's presentations, today's presentations, panel conversations, that metadata of varying kinds runs through every conversation, even conversations about things that you might not initially think are about metadata. I, I was very struck by Laura's presentation in Tasha's this morning, which was about uh, assessing value in OA agreements. Ostensibly, it turned into a metadata appeal for improvement in a funny way. And, and, and it's really encouraging at, in one respect to hear 
the value of metadata being repeated and repeated and repeated. But it's also incredibly dispiriting in some respects. It reminds me of, of being at a trade publishing conference 20 years ago or a music conference 15 years ago. Um, because if you went to a trade publishing conference 20 years ago, everybody was talking about, we need to do something about metadata. And this is a, tr this is a part of the industry that has had persistent identifiers since 1972. There are people in this room who weren't even born in 1972. They've had the ontologies, the taxonomies to support structured exchanges of metadata on a global network since 1999. Music has had DDEX, it's had recording codes and release IDs. They've adopted ISNIs for performers, etc., going back decades. And here we are still talking about it in the research ecosystem. And, and my observation, and sorry if it sounds rather cynical, we have to stop lamenting the absence of something and get on with the dirty work of building what's needed. We really do. And it's primarily not a technological challenge. Hmm. Uh, because it's not about just building what's absent. It's not just about improving the foundational stones that do exist. They are there. It's, there's so much more to it that's not technology. It's about, it, it's a social, communal governance challenge. And so this is something Veronica touched on a moment ago, you know. You need this coalition, not, not just of the willing, but of the, the expert and the powerful to really move this forward because it won't happen otherwise. I, I was the chair of ISO technical committee which created ISBN 13. And the number of people calling for me to lose my job at that point, because the transition from 10 digits to 13 digits was very expensive, and lots of trade house CEOs were saying, who is this idiot in London? making us make this change that's not necessary. Well, here we are 10 years later, and we have enough ISBNs for the globe for hundreds of years to come. So it requires investment, and I mean financial investment. The, the talk of um, low-cost metadata is nonsense. It really is a case of garbage in, garbage out. You've got to invest financially for well-structured um, metadata, because it's not about creating it, it's about maintaining it. It's about putting in place the governance structures to ensure it's maintained properly. It's about best practices globally. It's about certification programs around quality metadata. There's so much that goes into this, and it is not zero cost, either in terms of money or effort, it's not even low cost. One of the panelists on the previous panel you know, said quite rightly, it's an expensive thing. But we've got to start rolling up our sleeves and filling out the gaps where they exist. And it does re need a lot of leadership, a lot of coordination, as well as the technology chops to get it done. A leadership, coordination, collaboration as sure. well. Sure, absolutely collaboration, because um, people have to leave some vested interests at the door too, you know, yeah. um, because some of these foundation stones I was referring to, the challenge is not to get rid of them, it's, to ch it's the challenge, as somebody said earlier today, is to make them interoperable, because th that's just the way it is. Um, if you have like we have here, the community we're part of and the community we represent, we represent a, a global ecosystem. And it's, got, it's working in a networked environment. Everything has got to be interoperable because nobody's going to adopt one ring to rule them all, if you know what I mean. There are, there are going to be multiple identifiers. There are going to be multiple metadata standards, probably. They've got to be made interoperable for a global ecosystem like the one we represent. Right. 
Well, uh, I want to turn to a question from the audience here. Tasha Mellon Cohen, if you'd join us at the microphone. And of course, if you have a question, if you're online, if you have a question, you can use the chat. If you'd like to be up on Zoom with Katya, we would invite you to, uh, to turn your camera on if you, if you are so inclined. But first, Tasha Mellon's Cohen. So I initially put up a question that was um, about the value of fund ref, which I find enormously problematic because there is such a thing as grant DOIs and most funders won't use them. Um, but I would actually like to challenge that last statement a little bit because there has been an enormous investment in metadata, in PIDs, in quality standards. But we are operating in an environment where we have huge numbers of very, very small players who do not necessarily have the capacity to deliver the kinds of PIDs and the kinds of metadata that we want because there's always a new piece of the puzzle. How do we approach as a community that consistently growing number of pieces of metadata that we all want, but that maybe we didn't have two years ago, five years ago, in 1972 before I was born, uh, and things that we don't have today but might want next year. Well, I, I don't know who, who wants to take that, but maybe, Jose, if you can talk about that, because you've seen things go from zero to where they are today, uh, and you've benefited from that growth, and you've benefited from that uh, plethora of standards that you've been able to use for Atlantis. Is, is that how you see it, that really the more standards, the better? Or, or are you concerned about the point that Tasha was making about the sustainability of these standards over, the, over time? Well, um, this uh, sustainability is a, a great issue. And uh, we discuss a lot of uh, how to build this idea of a, a keychain key element within the lattice structure that would enable us to you know, just keep adding I identifiers and link that to that uh, researcher. And, um, and then we, we found out a lot of issues on uh, maintaining them. And as we talked, uh, Lattice is a, a live database. It's, it's updated. We have a, a close to a million and a half searches uh, every day. And uh, people are updating their, their information because they need it for various purposes within the, the university or, or, or other um, processes that they, they are part of. So they do update their information. But you know, references in, in, in persistent identifiers, um, they challenge, and, and this, in this case, the, our funding agency to maintain their contracts with some of these providers and also with other, regarding to other um, data sources, they need to update. And, and we're talking, when you have uh, 8 million people in, in, in a database, the, these data sets are very, very large. And uh, so, so our issue is uh, uh, scale. How, how do you maintain this? And, and we have had some uh, issues on, on, on keeping this structure up to date with every element within the PID, PID uh, vectors, right? So, so we, we focused on some ident persistent identifiers. And, uh, and, and, and what we're doing right now is, uh, you know, bridging another uh, form of, uh, uh, you know, when we go into the Vivo network, we do some work on linked data. So that, uh, in some sense, helps to avoid some of the issues, uh, but it's not, it's, it's not a, a hundred, we haven't mapped 100% of the database yet, so, but yeah, sustainability is a great issue um, and should be addressed. Right, I do want to get to one more question from the audience, but I, I want to give Katia Laranger a chance to, to respond to the question, because you're at the other end of things, you're really beginning your journey, and I wonder how you feel about this world that Tasha was describing. Well, I, I, I agree with Tasha and I agree with uh, Jose Salm Jr. Uh, sustainability is indeed a problem or an issue we have to consider. Trustworthiness is something that we have to consider when it comes to, to PIDs and other standards, of course. But our approach was very much um, 
the one that has been mentioned before, which is we try to be agnostic. So we try, first of all, as Matt was saying, we didn't try to build one system. So we have a very diverse landscape, like many countries have. So for us, it was obvious in the beginning that we couldn't go for a strategy where we'd have one research information system, one national one. We would want to embrace all the diversity we have in our landscape. And it's huge. It comes, some universities has no research information uh, management system. Some have commercial products, some have in-house developed products. So it's very, it's very diverse. And what we thought would be the best strategy would be to, um, to have interoperability. So that was the, the, our starting point. And uh, from that, when it comes to PIDs, what we want to have is as many PIDs as possible to be able to crosswalk and to guarantee that we have all the linking, accurate links between all the entities. So researchers, organizations, uh, scientific outputs, funding, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's our main, our main view on this. But I also wanted to add that I, I, I still believe that it's possible to build this virtuous circle. So even though I totally agree with Veronica that it is not the researcher uh, responsibility or it's not, in his, it's not his main interest to actually ensure that the metadata is there and it's accurate. But actually, if we make workflows easier and if we uh, make it so that the researcher has an incentive to actually put on this data, then it becomes easier for the researcher. There's, there's a purpose for it and we can all benefit from, from that. And I wanted to give you just a very specific example uh, regarding PEATS. So in our scientific management, uh, curriculum management platform, up until recently, what happened was that researchers would go to the platform and they could just say, uh, could, could just uh, pinpoint their affiliation. They would just uh, find in a Dropbox the organization they belong to and select it from a, a, a controlled list associated with persistent identifiers. But if they didn't find their uh, organization there, or sometimes it's actually there, but they just don't bother to look for it, they could create it, create one, uh, another registry. And that's very much still the case because of course we can't, uh, we can't uh, prevent anyone to apply for funding and don't have their affiliation because they don't find their organization on the list. So they have to have the ability to create a, a registry, a new registry. But what we see now is that when we launch the indicator service that is based on the information register on this platform, more and more researchers want to have their organization well represented. Mm -hmm. So more and more they go back to their curriculum and make sure they, they choose their organization from the list that is there. And if it's not there, they contact us to create a, a, a registry. So we, we then assign a PID and it all goes into place. So that's a way that in a way by creating this virtuous circle, the researcher is now has now benefits from the fact that he's registering metadata uh, in a proper way. Katya. And the, the yeah. Yeah, that's I, I, I really that's a great place to end. Unless Mark Carden, I guess you had a question. If you've got a question, you can get in thirty seconds. Okay. So all right. Well, well, listen, Katya. I'm sorry to uh, uh, no, keep that fine. short, but I really appreciate your answer. I appreciate the questions uh, from the audience. I think we learned a lot. Thank you to my panel, Katya Laranjera from PT Chris, uh, Jose Sam with Santa Candaria State University, Veronica Spinker with Tima, my colleague Michael Healy. Um, thank you for being here. I hope you made a good, or you think you made a good decision to join this session. Mark Twain said that good decisions come from experience. Experience comes from making bad decisions. Um, so thank you to everybody uh, at RTR for having us today. Thank you. Thank you.
So thanks to Chris and our panel. Uh, it is now time for a coffee break. Just a reminder that we will be rerunning a couple of the lightning talks from yesterday lunchtime in the Paget room. So do take your coffee in there. And uh, yes, hope we'll see you all back here at 4.15 for the last few sessions of the day. Thank you.